بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ومولانا محمد حبيب رب العالمين سيد الأولين والآخرين قائد الغر المحجلين وإمام المتقين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ثم أما بعد We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Lord of the heavens and the earth and we ask him to send his peace and blessings upon our master Sayyiduna Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam upon his blessed family, his loyal companions and all of those who followed after with excellence up until the day of standing. Ameen, ameen, ameen. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for ennoblement, sincerity, a continuity of his blessings and a beautiful end. Ya Rabbil Alameen wa Ya Arhamar Rahimeen. Thereafter, with the aforementioned chain of narration back the way to Al-Imam Abu Isa, Muhammad ibn Isa ibn Sawra al-Tirmidhi radiyallahu anhu who said in the second chapter of his book Al-Shama'il al-Muhammadiyyah wal Khasail al-Mustafawiyyah sallallahu ala sahibiha wa sallam Babu ma jaa'a fi khatam nubuwah what has been narrated concerning the seal of prophethood this is the second chapter that Imam Al-Tirmidhi radiyallahu anhu brings about in his work after bringing the chapter of the outer uh, features of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa his physical description, he moves over to speaking about the seal of prophethood. Now, why does he speak about the seal of prophethood? Right after the chapter in which he speaks about the physical features of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, the scholars have said, he dedicated an entire chapter to the seal of prophethood even though it was also from his physical features, because of its extra significance beyond the rest of his noble body, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Beyond the rest of his blessed body, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is one. And number two, the seal of prophethood wasn't as apparent as the rest of his blessed features, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For his seal of prophethood one was on his noble back and often it was covered by his blessed uh, shirt or his shawl or his uh, uh, robe or the clothes that he wore sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, and the third reason why Imam Tirmidhi radiallahu an singled out an entire chapter for the seal of prophethood because one of the most significant characteristics and features of our noble prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that he was the seal and finality of all of the prophets and messengers such that there will be no prophet or messenger who comes after him allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the quran al kareem in Surah Al-Ahzab. And Surah Al-Ahzab is a very important surah uh, because it speaks about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It speaks about the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It speaks about the loyalty of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It speaks about the household of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It speaks about the slave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sayyiduna Zayd ibn Harisa. It speaks about the finality of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It speaks about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's characteristics and his uh, noble traits that Allah describes him with and addresses him with by saying, Ya ayyuhan nabiyu inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadheeran wa da'iyan ila Allah bi idhnihi wa sirajan munira. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala lists out the characteristics and the, uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in these verses and then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala speaks about the marriages of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala speaks about those who bring harm to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam how they will be punished in this world and in the next by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and it is in Surah Al-Ahzab that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentions the verse Inna Allaha wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-nabi Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala sayyidina Muhammad Kullama dhakaraka al-dhakirun wa ghafala an dhikrika al-ghafilun 
this famous verse that we oft hear and oft recite is also in Surah Al-Ahzab. So Surah Al-Ahzab is very heavily connected to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Within Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, He said, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِّن رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمًا This is one of the four times in the Quran Al-Kareem when Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala explicitly mentions the blessed name of our master Sayyiduna Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The first time Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentions his blessed name is when he said, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not but a messenger. I.e. he is a messenger of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and that's his station. That's his station that he is Allah's messenger and that's in Surah Ali Imran. The second time Allah mentions it is in Surah Al-Ahzab in this verse that we recited مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ The third time that Allah mentions it is at the beginning of Surah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala He said الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَصَدُّوا عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَضَلَّ أَعْمَالَهُمْ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَآمَنُوا بِمَا نُزِّلَ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ وَهُوَ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ This is the third time that his blessed name is explicitly mentioned in the Quran. And the last and final time it's mentioned is in the last verse of Surah Al-Fatih when Allah Azza wa Jal said, Muhammadur Rasulullah. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His blessed name Muhammad is mentioned four times as we mentioned. And his blessed name Ahmad is mentioned once in the Quran Al-Kareem in Surah Al-Saf. When Sayyiduna Isa ala Nabiyina wa alayhi salatu was salam gave glad tidings to his pe- people and he said, Wa mubashiram bi rasulin yati min ba'd ismuhu Ahmad. And I give you glad tidings of a messenger who shall come after me and his name will be Ahmad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the scholars have said that his blessed name Muhammad is the name that is more frequently used upon the earth and his blessed name Ahmad is the one that's more frequently used in the heavens with the inhabitants of the heavens, with the angels. And the scholars have said, perhaps one of the reasons and the wisdoms behind that is that the word Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it means the most praised one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave this name to his beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so that upon the earth amongst mankind, he is the most praised one sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is a reality that is not hidden from the eyes of anybody that he indeed is the most praised one sallallahu alaihi wasallam whereas his name ahmad that means the one who praises allah the most the one who praises allah the most now that name ahmad is the name that is more frequently known in the heavens the scholars have said perhaps one of the wisdoms behind that is that the angels who are in the heavens the heavenly uh, inhabitants, they are always constantly in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the name of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ahmad, more frequent in the heavens, so that nobody ever thinks that, so that nobody ever thinks that there is any angel who can ever praise Allah more than Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he is Ahmad in the heavens, the one who praises Allah the most. Amongst the people who praise Allah the most, he is the one who praises Allah the most. Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam. So Allah said in Surah Al-Ahzab, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِّن رِجَالِكُمْ Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not the father of any of you men. He's not the father of any of you men. In Makkah al-Mukarramah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had a slave. His name was Zayd. Zayd was, when he was a young child, he was kidnapped from his caravan and he was brought to Makkah and he was sold in the markets of Makkah. And he was very close to the Prophet Sallallahu and we know that the male children of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they would die in infancy. They would die as young children. 
So the Meccan people, they saw the Zayds always with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they began to say, Zayd ibn Muhammad. Zayd is the son of Muhammad. And this was a famous name for him in Mecca. Everybody knew him by this, Zayd ibn Muhammad. And this was a great honor for him. But then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala wanted to, uh, uh, he wanted to abolish this. That any person is given the name of the Prophet Sallallahu that he is their father. So he said, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not the father of any of you men. After that day, Zayd was then known as Zayd ibn Haritha. Haritha was his father. That was his biological, his real father. So he was known as Zayd ibn Haritha. Why did Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala say this? مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ That Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not the father of any of you men. The scholars have said, previous prophets, their children were also prophets. So we see Sayyiduna Ya'qub alayhi salam. His son. We see Sayyiduna. We see Sayyiduna Ya'qub alayhi salam. His son, Sayyiduna Yusuf alayhi salam, was a prophet. We see Sayyiduna Ibrahim alayhi salam, his sons Sayyiduna Ishaq and Ismail alayhi salam, they were prophets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't want anybody to refer to the children of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam as having prophethood. This is why they died in infancy. But on top of that, Allah said, no man is ever allowed to say I am the son of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam in his time, in his days. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So that nobody ever thinks later on This child is a prophet too Because he's the son of a prophet So Allah abolished that by saying مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ Then he said وَلَكِنْ But rather وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ Rather he is the messenger of Allah And the finality and seal of prophethood وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِي He is the last and final of prophets. Now the scholars have said, there is a unanimous agreement. There is a unanimous agreement in this ummah, which is known as ijma' amongst the sahaba and everybody after, that the meaning of خَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ is the last, final and seal of all of the prophets. The last final and seal of all of the Prophets. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he explained this himself and he said, He said, Ana khatamun nabiyyin. I am the last and final of Prophets. La nabiyya ba'di. They will never be a Prophet after me. They will never be a Prophet after me. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also warned us and informed us. He said, سَيَكُونُ فِي أُمَّةِ ثَلَاثُونَ دَجَّالُونَ كَذَّابُونَ He said, after me there will be 30 individuals who will be extreme liars and every one of them will be a Dajjal. Every one of them will uh, claim prophecy. Will claim to be a prophet. Some of them were in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, like Musaylam al-Kazzab who was fought against by Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyallahu an. Sayyiduna Abu Bakr took an enormous army of companions against Musaylam al-Kazzab and he defeated the Musaylama and his people. Who was the person who actually killed Musaylam al-Kazzab? Sayyiduna Wahshi radiyallahu an. The one who killed Sayyiduna Hamza in Uhud, he was the one who killed uh, Musaylam al-Kazzab. On the day that he killed Musaylam al-Kazzab, what did he say? He said, in, the, in my days of ignorance, I killed the best of people. And in my days of Islam, I killed the worst of people. He said, oh Allah, take this as an expiation for that. He said, the wrong that I did by killing Sayyidina Hamza, oh Allah, take this, i.e. my killing of the worst of people, the most evil of people, and the one who claims prophethood after the Prophet Sallallahu oh Allah, take this as a means of expiation for that sin that I committed. The scholars have said that there is no prophet after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There won't be a real prophet 
nor will there be a shadow prophet, nor will there be an assistant prophet, nor did the Prophet ﷺ need help from anybody in his prophethood and in his messengership ﷺ. This is one of the most fundamental beliefs of the people of Islam. Anybody who denies the finality of the Prophet ﷺ, or anybody who believes in his finality, but yet believes that there will be prophets after him, whether those prophets are real prophets or shadow prophets, real prophets or assistant prophets, those people are people of disbelief, are people of kufr, and are not people from the people of Islam categorically. So the finality of the Prophet ﷺ is one of the most fundamental. It's okay. The finality of the Prophet ﷺ is one of the most fundamental beliefs of the people of Islam. Denial of it is disbelief. Belief of any type of Prophet to appear, to emerge after Sayyidina Muhammad ﷺ is absolute disbelief. Is absolute disbelief. And this is a point and a matter that we have to have crystal clear in our minds and we must teach it to our children and we must make it firm in their hearts for there are people in the world who claim to be muslim who claim to accept the prophethood of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam yet they believe in prophets or a prophet who came after him sallallahu alaihi wasallam this is impossible somebody who has a belief like that cannot be from the people of islam can only be from the people of disbelief and kufr this is one of the major reasons that Imam Al-Tirmidhi radiallahu an began after the first chapter with, 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 the, with the seal of prophethood so he could stamp into our hearts the finality of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So we have the first hadith. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin. Imam Al-Tirmidhi radiyallahu anhi said, Haddathana Abu Raja'in Qutayba ibn Sa'id, Haddathana Hatim ibn Ismail, Anil Ja'ad ibn Abdul Rahman qal, Anil Ja'ad ibn Abdul Rahman qal, Sami'tu al-Sa'iba ibn Yazid yaqul. Imam Al-Tirmidhi with his chain of narration, he said, I heard al-Sa'ib ibn Yazid say, What did al-Sa'ib ibn Yazid say? Al-Sa'ib ibn Yazid was one of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, my maternal aunt took me to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, O Messenger of Allah, my nephew is suffering from a pain. So he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wiped his blessed hand on my head and prayed that I be blessed. Then he performed ritual purification wudu and I drank from his leftover ritual purification water I stood behind him I stood behind his blessed back and gazed upon the seal of prophethood between his blessed shoulders and lo and behold it was like a button of a bed canopy in size so Asaib ibn Yazid radiallahu anh said my aunt my maternal aunt i.e. my khala took me to the Prophet sallallahu why did she take him to the Prophet sallallahu because he was unwell what did he say? He said the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam wiped his blessed hand on my head and he prayed for me. He wiped his blessed hand on my head and he prayed for me. Then he performed wudu and then he gave me water from his leftover wudu to drink from. Now here the scholars have said, what do we notice? We notice that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum they used to take their ill ones to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Why? In seeking blessings and dua from the Messenger of Allah, in hope that Allah would give cure to their children and to their ill ones through the blessings of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is number one. Number two, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught the Sahaba certain duas to make when they would fall ill. Yet the Sahaba radiallahu anhu would still come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in wanting him to make those du'as for them and in seeking his blessings. So the scholars have said, 
when the Sahaba were not able to reach him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then they would recite the words and the du'as that he had taught them to seek cure from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala from their ills. Also, we see that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam placed his blessed hands over the head of Asa'ib ibn Yazid. And we have many narrations in the books of Hadith. We have many narrations in the books of Hadith indicating how the blessed hand of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam cured the ill. One companion, he said, I came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when I had a severe skin condition. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam instructed me to take off my shirt. And he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wiped his blessed hands over my upper body. He said, the skin condition was removed and it disappeared from when the Prophet ﷺ touched my upper body and from that day onwards, the fragrance of the blessed hands of the Prophet never left my body. The fragrance of the Prophet's noble body, uh, hands never left my body. ﷺ. Then he performed the ritual wudu. Now the scholars here have said, either the Prophet ﷺ performed wudu to get ready for prayer, and he said to a sa'ib, take the remainder of the wudu from the vessel that he made wudu from and drink it to seek blessings. Or the Prophet ﷺ wasn't going to pray a ritual prayer, but rather he specifically made wudu for this ill person so that this ill person takes from the remaining water of his wudu and is cured through that. The scholars have said, whichever the case is, whether the Prophet ﷺ made wudu for prayer and then gave the remainder of his water to this ill person to drink from, that's a clear indication that the Prophet ﷺ was, in, was encouraging his companions to take from the remainder of his water to seek blessings from that. Now the scholars have said, was it that Asaib ibn Yazid drank from the remainder of the Prophet's wudu water, or was it that he took from the dripping water from his blessed limbs? The scholars have said, both is possible. Because we have times when the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they would not allow for a single drop of water to touch the ground when he performed wudu, but rather they would take that water and wipe it over their faces and bodies. And those who didn't take, those who didn't take, or was it when close enough to take from the water that was dripping from his noble body, they would go and wipe their hands on the hands of the companions who had the water from the droplets of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they would say, pass your hand over here, and wipe over their hands and then wipe their bodies with that. He said, I drank from his leftover ritual purification water. Also this occurred for Sayyiduna Ali and Sayyida Fatima Zahra radiallahu anhuma. When the Prophet sallallahu conducted their nikah and he sent them home, he said to them, wait for me in your home. And the Prophet sallallahu went to them. He sallallahu alayhi wasallam performed wudu and then he gave from the leftover water to both of them to drink and then he prayed for them and he said Allahumma barik lahuma wa fi naslihima O oh Allah bless both of them and bring much blessing through their offspring and through their children no. Asaib ibn Yazid radiallahu anh then said I stood behind his blessed back and gazed upon the seal of prophethood remember in the previous lesson we mentioned that the colors of the, uh, of the clothing of the Prophet ﷺ were extremely wide. They weren't very tight colors the way we wear tight colors. They were extremely white, wide such that if his uh, shirt was loose from behind, one would be able to see, one would be able to see the, the seal of prophethood on the Prophet ﷺ's back. So Asaib ibn Yazid said, I went behind his back and I was able to see the seal of prophethood. Now why did Imam Tirmidhi bring this as the first narration in this chapter? The scholars have said, to indicate to us 
that the seal of prophethood was something that the Sahaba would see occasionally. They would be able to witness it and see it on his noble body, number one. Number two, Asaib ibn Yazid was a young child at this time. Again, we mentioned previously that the children, they observe more clearly and more accurately than adults. So the description of Asaib ibn Yazid was, was very accurate that he noticed that there was something different on the back of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam and that was the seal of prophethood. Uh, again, the description of Asaib ibn Yazid here is an approximation. What did he say? He said, I stood behind his blessed back and gazed upon the seal of prophethood between his blessed shoulders. The scholars have said this was an approximation. In other narrations, we find that the seal of prophethood was above his left shoulder blade, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Was above the left shoulder blade. Why was it here? Imam Ibn Abdul Barr al Maliki, radiallahu an, he says the reason why the seal of prophethood was on the left side of the uh, on the left of the upper on the left side on the left above the left shoulder blade the reason why it was here imam ibn abdul barr al-maliki he says he says this is the point which the shaitan enters into the human body this is the point at which the shaitan enters into the human body Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed the seal of prophethood at that point on the body of the Prophet ﷺ to indicate that there is no entrance for him into the body of the Prophet ﷺ. This is number one. He also said, why was it placed on the Prophet's back? The scholars of hadith have said, every single Prophet before the Prophet ﷺ had a sign on their right hands and these were signs of their prophethood. Every prophet had a sign, but their signs were on their right hands. Their signs were on their right hands. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't place the sign of the Prophet ﷺ on his right hand, but rather he placed it on his back. Why is this? The scholars have said, number one, the Prophet ﷺ's blessed face and his luminous countenance was enough of a sign for those who were approaching him and seeing him that he is the last and final prophet, that he is a prophet. Whereas the sign of prophethood that was placed on his back was to indicate that he is the last and final of prophets and therefore his seal on his, is on his back and therefore there will be no prophet who will come from behind him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is why the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Ana Muhammad, Ana Ahmad, Ana Al Hashir, Ana Al Aqib, Ana Al Mahi. He ﷺ mentioned five of his blessed names in one hadith, and one of them was Al Aqib. And Al Aqib means the one who comes at the end after whom there is nobody. And that's the Prophet ﷺ. This is why the seal of prophethood was on his back to indicate that no prophet can come from behind him. And the scholars have said, Previously, when people used to write letters and they used to seal the letter, where would they seal it? They would seal the envelope at the back and they would stamp it so that when this letter reaches the recipient, that the, pers the recipient will be able to notice that this letter has not been opened because the seal is intact. This is why the seal of the Prophet ﷺ was on his back to, to let the world know that there is no prophet to come after him and the prophet sallallahu will return back to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the seal on his back sallallahu alaihi wasallam because there will be no prophet after him then the scholars spoke about when this seal appeared on his noble back sallallahu alaihi wasallam some of the scholars they said he sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam was born with the with the with the khatm al nubuwa with the seal of prophethood on his back other scholars said that the seal of prophethood appeared on his blessed back at the age of 40. So there's a dispute amongst the scholars based upon their evidences. Some said he was born with it, others said it appeared 
from the age of 40. But we are for sure 100% that after the age of 40, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they saw the seal of prophethood on his blessed back. Then he mentioned its size. What did he say? It was like a button of a bed canopy. What's a bed canopy? The scholars have said, uh, a bed canopy or a button of the top of a tent. Now, uh, if we imagine, if we make a, sh a, a tent, uh, we, 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 uh, we place f four or five sticks in the ground. We place four or five sticks in the ground and we raise on top of those sticks uh, a cloth, right? We raise on top of those sticks a cloth and we join those sticks in the middle. We join the sticks in the middle together to make an arched shape. And when we tie the top of that cloth, that's the button of a canopy. That's the button of a canopy. So, Asaib ibn Yazid, when he described the uh, seal of prophethood, he said it was like the size of a button, uh, the button of a canopy, i.e. it was small in size and it was something that was protruding. It was something that was standing out from his back. The way the button on top of the canopy stands out from the rest of the tent, this is how the seal of prophethood stood out from the rest of his noble back, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The next narration is from Jabir ibn Samura. He said, I saw the seal of prophethood between the blessed shoulders of the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was a morsel that was slightly raised, reddish in color and like a pigeon's egg in size. Like a pigeon's egg in size, right, i.e. small in size, i.e. it was small in size and it was outstanding on his blessed back, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He, sa he also described it to be reddish in color and slightly raised. The next narration is from, uh, is from Asim ibn Umar ibn Qatada, who narrates from his grandmother Rumaytha, radiallahu anha. What did she say? Allahu Akbar. Rumaytha radiallahu anha said, I heard the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and, uh, and had I wished to kiss the seal of prophethood between his blessed shoulders that day, I could have, owing, owing to his proximity to me. So what is she, she saying? She's narrating a hadith to us, but at the same time, she's narrating how close she was standing to the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She said, I heard the Prophet وسلم, but where was I when I heard him? She said, I was so close to him and I could see the seal of prophethood on his back that had I wanted to kiss it, I would have been able to kiss it because I was so close to him But why didn't she kiss it? Why didn't she approach the Prophet وسلم, Out of her adab and out of her haya from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is the adab that the female sahabiyat of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa taught us with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And this is something very important for the women folk of Islam. And that is that they maintain due etiquette and mannerism and adab even with the scholars, with their teachers, and all those who are not of their families and not mahram unto them, they have to keep due uh, respect and mannerism and adab and not draw uh, physically close to them because they are not their mahrams. Whereas Sayyida Rumisa, she was from the companions. And a female companion of the Prophet ﷺ, what more could she ever wish for than touching the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What did she say? I didn't. Why? Because this is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught. So if this female companion is not touching the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then how is it possible that a female student can touch her male teacher or her male sheikh or her male guide? This is not from the etiquettes of Islam. This is not from the adab of the people of Islam. And we have to give 
we, we have to give this matter its due. And if we don't give this matter its due, then we end up in troubles and in problems and in difficulties that are caused within communities and in societies. We must know the adab with which we connect onto our teachers and our scholars and our guides and those whom we take benefit from. So she is narrating to us a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu But at the same time, she's also narrating to us the fact that she was so close to the Prophet Sallallahu And she saw the seal of prophethood on his blessed back Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What was it that the Prophet said that day when she was so close to him? She said, I heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, يَقُولُ لِسَعْدِ بْنِ مُعَاذِ يَوْمَ مَاتَ اِهْتَزَّ لَهُ عَرْشُ الرَّحْمَانِ She said, I heard the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say on the day Sa'd ibn Mu'adh radiyallahu an passed away, the throne of the All Merciful Ar-Rahman shook for him. What does that mean? That the day that Sayyiduna Sa'd ibn Mu'adh radiyallahu an passed away, his departure from this world was such that Allah's throne, Allah's Arsh shook when he died. The scholars have said, why was it that Allah's throne shook when Sayyidina Mu'adh radiallahu anh died? When Sayyidina uh, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu anh died? The scholars have said, it's possible that Allah's throne shook out of happiness and joy for the arrival of the soul of Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu anh to the gardens of paradise. Number two, the scholars have said, it's possible that the angels who carry Allah's throne, they, they, they shook out of happiness and joy upon hearing about the arrival of the soul of Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu anh. And it's also possible that those angels descended to pray the janazah of Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh for the Prophet sallallahu mentioned that angels descended to pray his janazah. The scholars have said, this is similar to when the Prophet ﷺ stood upon the mountain of Uhud. What happened to the mountain of Uhud? It began to shake out of happiness and joy upon kissing the blessed feet of the Prophet ﷺ. This is similar to when the Prophet ﷺ moved away from the tree that he used to stand beside and deliver his khutbah. When he moved away from it, it began to cry and shake out of feeling the distance from the Prophet ﷺ. So the scholars have said, in the same way, Allah's arsh shook upon the passing of Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh out of happiness and joy upon the arrival of this soul back to the gardens of paradise. So the scholars have said that when the righteous leave this world and they return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the angels anticipate them and await them. The people of the akhirah welcome them into the abodes of Jannah. Welcome them in the, into the abodes of Jannah. The next narration is from, uh, he said, Haddasani Ibrahim ibn Muhammad. Ibrahim ibn Muhammad, who was, this Muhammad is Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya, who we spoke about in the previous lessons from the children of Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu an. He said, uh, when Ali radiallahu an would describe the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he would say, he mentioned the narration in full up until he, Ali radiallahu anh, said, between his blessed shoulders was the seal of prophethood and he is the seal of prophets. This is a portion of a hadith which is from the first chapter which Imam Tirmidhi radiallahu anh, repeated here. Why did he repeat it here? He repeated it here to have confirmation from Sayyiduna Ali that the Prophet had the seal of prophethood on his back. Why? Because Sayyiduna Ali was from the household of the Prophet ﷺ, so he would see the Prophet ﷺ in situations and in, in the intimacy of his blessed home, the way other companions wouldn't see him. So to confirm this from Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu anh. The next narration is from Abu Zayd, Amr ibn Akhtab al-Ansari. He said, the messenger of Allah ﷺ said to me, Ya Aba Zayd, udnu minni famsah zahri. The Prophet said to him, Abu Zayd, Come close to me and rub my back. 
come close to me and rub my back. The scholars have said, why did the Prophet say to him, rub my back? The scholars have said, perhaps because the Prophet realized Abu Zaid wants to see the seal of prophethood, but he's shy to ask about it. So the Prophet ﷺ gave him an excuse to come close to him so that he sees the seal of prophethood. So what did he say? This is one, that the Prophet knew that he wants to see it, so he made it. Or the scholars have said that the Prophet ﷺ felt some discomfort in his back and wanted for Sayyidina Abu Zaid to wipe his back and then he coincidentally also, his fingers passed by the seal of prophethood. So two reasons, possible reasons. So Abu Zaid radiallahu anh then said, uh, he said, and so I rubbed his blessed back and my fingers touched the blessed seal. Then the narrator before Abu Zaid, who is Ilba, he said, I, I meaning Ilba asked Abu Zaid, what is the seal? He replied, a collection of hairs. So when he was rubbing the back of the Prophet ﷺ, which was absolutely smooth, then suddenly he came across an area where he touched, where he felt some hairs. And that's how he described it. He in this narration didn't describe it to be outstanding and raised on the Prophet's back, but what he described it with, that there were some hairs, and that was the seal of prophethood. Sheikh Abdullah Sirajuddin radiallahu anh, in his work of Shama'il said, that those other Sahaba, when they spoke about the seal of prophethood, they said they were blessed hairs that were always illuminated with light. There was always a light that was emanating from those blessed hairs. And here the, the scholars have said, look at the easygoing nature of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to make things uh, to make things comfortable for his companions. He would call them over and say, rub my back, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, to make them feel at ease in the presence of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The next narration, uh, Abdullah ibn Buraida narrated uh, to me, I heard my father Buraida say, when the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, arrived in Medina, which arrival is this? This is his first arrival when he came from Makkah al Mukarramah to Medina al Munawwara. Because the Prophet ﷺ would often in his Medinan days travel out of Medina and every time he would return, he would always have a special arrival that the Sahaba would give him. He would always have a special arrival that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum would give him. But this particular arrival is when, when he arrived for the first time from Makkah to Medina al Munawwara. Salman al Farisi came bearing a tray of fresh dates. Salman al Farisi radiallahu anh, we should all read his biography. He lived for a very long time searching for the truth and uh, eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought him to the Prophet sallallahu He came to the Prophet sallallahu with a tray of dates. We have in other narrations that Salman came with some cooked meat. With some cooked meat. The scholars have said, perhaps there were more dates than meat. So this is why this narrator said, there were dates and didn't mention the meat. But other narrations also mention that he was carrying a, a tray that had meat, cooked meat upon it. So he brought it to the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet said to him, What's this Salman? What's this Salman? And Salman al-Farisi said, Messenger of Allah, this is, this is charity for you and your companions. This is charity for you and your companions. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, raise this, for we do not eat from that which is for charity. We do not eat from that which is for charity. Now the scholars have said, when the Prophet ﷺ said, we do not eat from that which is from charity, who was he referring to in the we? The scholars have said, either he was referring to his blessed self and all of the prophets, or his blessed self and his blessed household, Ahlul Bayt. And the scholars have said, zakat was not permissible and is still not permissible for the Prophet ﷺ and his Ahlul Bayt, his noble family. Why? Because zakat is from the filth of people's wealth and it doesn't befit 
for that to be given to the Messenger of Allah or his blessed household because the Messenger of Allah is pure and by virtue of him are his blessed household also pure. Is that clear? This is number one. Number two, zakat is an obligation. It's a fard. The way our prayers are fard, fasting is fard. Zakat is also an obligation, a fard. We don't have a choice whether we can pay zakat or not. We have to pay it. Whether we like it or not, we have to pay it. So in zakat, in paying zakat, there might be somebody who doesn't wholeheartedly pay their zakat, but pays it because they think, I'm obliged, I have to do it. Whereas when you gift somebody something, you're not obliged to give anybody a gift. When you give them, it will always be wholeheartedly and not because you've been obliged. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't want anybody to come and present anything to the Prophet ﷺ whilst they were being obliged and they weren't wholehearted and generous with that. So Allah made it prohibited for the Prophet and his family to take that which is from the wealth of zakat. So Salman took it. The next day he came back and he placed something before the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet said, Salman, what's this? He said, Messenger of Allah, this is a gift for you. What did he miss out this time? Your companions. Why did he say this is a gift for you this time round? He wanted to make he wanted to make it more personalized now with the Prophet. Whereas when you give charity, when you give charity, it doesn't matter who you give it to. You can give it to this person, you can give it to that person. Your job is done with your charity. But when you choose to give a gift, you choose very specific people, very particular people. So for example, when the people are coming around to collect for zakat and collect for charity, when putting your money of charity and zakat in, do you specify to the collector, make sure you give it to so-and-so? It doesn't matter to you to who takes that wealth of charity. As long as it's given to the poor, as long as it's given to the needy, it's done. Whereas when you give a gift to somebody, you're going to write their name on it. You're going to send it to their particular address. You're going to make sure you give it to the particular individual. Salman al-Farisi said, Messenger of Allah, this is a gift for you. He didn't mention the companions here. Why? Because he wanted to personalize his relationship with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when he said this, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he never ever, uh, he, he never... He always included his companions in everything that he had. He always shared with his companions everything that he had. So what did he say? He said, extend your hands. He said to his companions, come along, extend your hands. Join in to what Salman has given us. And that was from the generosity of the Prophet ﷺ. He would always share with, with, with his companions and with others. When Sayyida Fatima radiallahu anha, came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asking him for a slave or a servant who will help them out in the chores of the, of the, of the house. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to her, I'm not going to leave my companions who sit in my masjid day and night, Ahlu Sufa, whilst their stomachs are empty and cringing from hunger and give you. What does that mean? That means the Prophet Sallallahu was was absolutely caring for his Sahaba just the way he was caring for his Ahlul Bayt. So he said, extend your hands. He, Salman, later saw the seal of prophethood on the blessed back of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi and immediately believed in him. The scholars have said, the first two parts of the hadith, the presentation of charity and then the presentation of a gift was one after the other. Whereas witnessing the seal of prophethood happened some time later. Why did, why these particular three particulars? Because before Salman reached Madinatul Munawwara, he was informed that the sign of the last and final prophet is that he doesn't take charity, he accepts gifts and on his back is the seal of prophethood. On his back is the seal of prophethood. So he saw the seal of prophethood. Where did he see it? He saw it 
after the Prophet ﷺ buried one of his companions in Jannatul Baqi'ah, Salman al Farisi saw the seal of prophethood on his back. And then he accepted Islam and he believed in the Prophet. ﷺ. At that time, he was owned by some Jews. The scholars have said either he was owned by one Jew or a group of Jews, several of them. So the Messenger of Allah ﷺ purchased him for a certain number of dirhams with the condition that he, i.e. the Prophet ﷺ, plant date palm trees for them and that Salman tend to them until they produce fruit. Now among slaves, you have different types. You have a raqiq who's an absolute slave. A raqiq is an absolute slave. Then you have a slave who can have a contract with his master. And that's known as a mukatab. A mukatab slave is the one who has a contract with his master that if you pay up, if you go and work and pay me X amount of wealth, you'll be free. And that's what Sayyidina Salman was now. He had a contract and an agreement uh, with his people that the Prophet ﷺ was going to purchase him. The Prophet said, I want to purchase him. They said to the Prophet ﷺ, fine, but he has to give X amount of gold and he has to uh, plant our trees and look after them until they bear fruit. So he was a mukatab. And the third type is a mudabbar. Mudabbar is when the master says to the slave, after I die, you're free. So, so long as the master is alive, he is a slave. Once the master dies, then that slave is free. So Salman al-Farisi, the Prophet ﷺ purchased him for a certain number of dirhams. How much was that amount? The amount of dirhams that he was purchased for was 29, uh, was 40 uqiyya of gold, which is equivalent to 29 grams of gold. And that he planted 300 date palm trees. The Prophet ﷺ planted all the tree, uh, date palm trees except for one, which was planted by Sayyidina Umar. Look at the humbleness of the Prophet. ﷺ. Salman accepted Islam, the Prophet purchased him. Salman was a foreigner, he wasn't an Arab. The Prophet ﷺ purchased him. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ encouraged, encouraged his companions to purchase slaves and to free them. He didn't abolish slavery. He didn't abolish slavery, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But what he did do was that he taught the world a lesson in how to treat slaves. That those who saw the Prophet treating slaves will see that he treated slaves better than how people treat free men upon the earth. That's how he treated slaves, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the slaves who were with him. And when they saw his treatment and how he dealt with them, they were happy with slavehood with the Prophet ﷺ than to be free, free men with anybody else in the world. The Prophet ﷺ planted the 300 palm uh, trees, except one, Sayyidina Umar planted it. Why did Sayyidina Umar plant it? He thought he'd come and give a hand to the Prophet ﷺ, so he planted one. Perhaps he came towards the end and he planted one. All the date palms bore fruit the very same year. And that's from the miracles of the Prophet ﷺ. It's not possible for date palm trees to give fruit in the, in the first year. They take a long time to grow and to give fruit. But these trees, they gave fruit immediately in one year. Except one tree, the tree that Sayyidina Umar planted. The Prophet said, what's the matter with this date palm tree? Umar replied, O Messenger of Allah, I planted it. The Prophet ﷺ uprooted the tree and replanted it and it bore fruit within the year. So Sayyidina Umar an, he thought that he would come and give a hand to the Prophet ﷺ, not knowing that the Messenger of Allah ﷺ was going to show them a miracle was going to show them 
a miracle. And that was that through the blessings of his plantation, they will bear fruit within one year. Within one year. And that's what happened. And after that, Sayyidina Salman al-Farsi radiallahu anh, was also freed. So the, the point of this particular hadith here is that Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anh, before he accepted Islam, he was told that the seal of prophethood is one of the signs of the truthfulness of the last and final prophet. When he saw the seal of prophethood on his back, he accepted Islam. He accepted Islam. So the seal of prophet was, prophethood was also a means for people to accept Islam and enter into the fold of Islam. Who told him these three signs? People of the previous scriptures told him of these three signs. How did they know about these three signs? Because they used to read in their previous scriptures the description of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and amongst that they found these three descriptions. And Allah mentions this in the Quran. الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الرَّسُولَ النَّبِيَّ الْأُمِّيَّ الَّذِي يَجِدُونَهُ مَكْتُوبًا عِنْدَهُمْ فِي التَّوْرَاتِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الرَّسُولَ النَّبِيَّ الْأُمِّيَّ Those who follow الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الرَّسُولَ Those who follow the messenger الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الرَّسُولَ النَّبِيَّ الْأُمِّيَّ Those who follow the messenger, the prophet, the ummi The ummi Who is the ummi? The word ummi, the scholars have different interpretations for it. Some said he was ummi, meaning he was from Makkah to Al-Mukarramah. Why? Because one of the names of Makkah in the Quran is Ummul Qura, the mother of, of the cities, the mother of the villages, the mother of the lands, Ummul Qura. So hence he was ummi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another is that ummi that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was only taught by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by nobody else. Is that clear? By nobody else. Allah said, those who follow the, the messenger, the prophet, the ummi, يَجِدُونَهُ مَكْتُوبًا عِنْدَهُمْ فِي التَّوْرَاتِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ They will find his description written with them in the Torah and in the Injil. In the Torah and in the Injil. And there are other descriptions that the people of the scriptures mentioned to the Makkans. They said to the Makkans, if he can answer these three questions, he's a true prophet. What were those three questions that the people of the scripture told the Makkans? If he can tell you about the soul, Allah said, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي They will ask you about the soul, tell them, the matter of the soul is from the affairs of my Lord. Number one, if he can tell you, about the soul. Number two, if he can tell you about Dhul Qarnayn, mentioned Surah Al Kahf, and if he can tell you the story of Musa and Khadr, السلام, then he is the true prophet. Then he is the true prophet. When the Meccans returned and came to the Prophet وسلم, and they asked him these three questions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent revelation to him and he answered all three questions. And that was the sign that he is a true prophet if he can answer these questions. So what does that mean? That means that the prophethood of the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his finality was confirmed by the people of the previous scriptures because all of the signs that they were told about, they found in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then the question is, then why didn't some of them believe in him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? They believe, them not believing in him was a personal grudge rather than, uh, rather than the evidences and the proofs not being there. Is that clear? They had personal, uh, personal reasons why they didn't believe in him. Otherwise, the signs of his prophethood were crystal clear to them. The next narration, Abi Nadra al-Awaqi said, I, sal I asked Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu an about the seal of prophethood and he replied, it was, slightly ra uh, it was a slightly raised morsel of flesh on his blessed upper back sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The last narration of this chapter.
The last narration of this chapter is from Abdullah ibn Sarjis radiallahu an. He said, I came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whilst he was with some of his companions. I went behind his, I went behind him like this. So now Abdullah ibn Sarjis is narrating to people after him that I went to the Prophet ﷺ whilst he was with his companions, I went behind him like this. What does this mean? The people that he was narrating to, either he stood up in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ to show them the exact location where he went behind the back of the Prophet ﷺ, or how he turned behind the back of the Prophet ﷺ to see, see the seal of prophethood. He said, I went behind him like this. The Prophet realized I wanted, uh, the, the Prophet realized what I wanted. So he removed his cloak, Rida, from his blessed back, and lo, I saw the place between his blessed shoulders on which was the seal. So what happened there? The Prophet ﷺ is with his companions and Abdullah ibn Sarjis went behind the Prophet ﷺ's back. The Prophet immediately realized what he wants. Why would somebody go behind the Prophet's back? To see the seal of prophethood. What did the Prophet ﷺ do? He lowered his rida, his upper garment, he lowered it slightly and Abdullah ibn Sarjis said, I saw the seal of prophethood on his back. So the Sahaba radiallahu anhum when they found out about the seal of prophethood, they were eager to see it for themselves. They were eager to see it for themselves. What happened next? He said, it was like a clenched fist around which were some beauty marks. The scholars have said, it was like a clenched fist, not in size, because a clenched fist in size is big. What he meant is, it's not flat like the flat hand, but rather it's raised like the clenched fist. So this, this is when the hand is flat and this is when the hand is clenched. What's the difference is now the knuckles are raised. So Abdullah ibn Sarjis was saying it was like a clenched fist on his back, whereas his back is absolutely smooth and then there was something outstanding and raised on his blessed back, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Around which were some beauty marks. It was as if it was as if it were a round and raised piece of flesh. I went back around until I faced him and said. So then he came in front of the Prophet ﷺ. Just imagine this. He went behind the Prophet. There's a group of companions. Abdullah ibn Sarjis went back and the Prophet loosened his rida and Abdullah ibn Sarjis saw the seal of prophethood and then he came back in front of the Prophet ﷺ. When he came in front of the Prophet ﷺ, what did he say? He said, غفر الله لك يا رسول الله May Allah forgive you, O Messenger of Allah. Now, this expression this phrase, غَفَرَ اللَّهُ لَكَ doesn't indicate that the Prophet ﷺ had any sins. This is an expression of love. This is an expression of kindness and love that Abdullah ibn Sarjis was expressing to the Prophet ﷺ by saying, غَفَرَ اللَّهُ لَكَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهُ May Allah forgive you, O Messenger of Allah. Not forgive you of any sin. What this means is, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala further ennoble you and raise you in your ranks. Is that clear? What we have to understand from this is that غفر الله لك was an expression on the tongues of the companions to make du'as for people even if they didn't have sin. Is that clear? When he said to the Prophet sallallahu may Allah forgive you, O Messenger of Allah. Look at the humbleness of the Prophet sallallahu what did he say? He said, he said, he replied, he replied, and may he forgive you too. The Prophet ﷺ then said to him, he said, Walaka, may Allah forgive you also. Qal al qawm the people to whom he was narrating, or the Sahaba who were there, asked him, did the Messenger of Allah really ask forgiveness on your behalf? I, they were excited. Did the Prophet pray that Allah forgives you? That's something amazing. 
because they knew that the Prophet's du'as were all accepted. So they said, are you for real that the Prophet prayed for you and said, may Allah forgive you? And Abdullah ibn Sarjis, look at his kindness. He said, I replied, yes, and for you also. He said, he prayed for me, but he also prayed for the rest of you. And then he gave evidence for that from the Quran. And then he, Abdullah ibn Sarjis, recited, وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكَ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ And if you look in the translation of this verse, what does it say? Then he, Abdullah ibn Sarjis, recited the verse, and seek forgiveness for your dhamb. And seek forgiveness for your dhamb. And for the wrong actions of the believing men and women. Right. You know this, the translation of this particular verse? The translation of this particular verse in this particular manner has never been done ever before. At least in the English language. And what's that? That the word dhamb wasn't translated into English. It was left as Allah said it. Allah said to the Prophet Sallallahu And seek forgiveness for your dhamb. Why didn't we translate this into the English? Because generally and normally if people translate this, they would say, and seek forgiveness for your sin. But we know that the Prophet ﷺ is sinless. So this word in reference to the Prophet ﷺ must mean something else. So therefore, we left the word as Allah said it, and then we, uh, we explained it in the side footnote in detail so that we understand that the Messenger of Allah had no sins, no wrongdoings, no wrong actions. So when Allah said to him, وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكْ And seek forgiveness for your dhanb, what does that mean? The scholars have said, whenever we find statements in the Qur'an or in the Sunnah that from the apparent may indicate, from the apparent may indicate that there was uh, a mention of sin or the likes regarding the prophets and messengers we must always interpret those texts based upon the fundamental belief of the people of Islam regarding the prophets and messengers that they are infallible that they are sinless is that clear? so how did the scholars explain this verse when Allah said to the prophet seek forgiveness for your dhamb the scholars have many interpretations. Imam Ibn Jassus al Maghribi radiallahu anhu said, The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was always elevated in stations and in ranks, as Allah said, Walal akhiratu khayrul laka min al ula. And that which is to come for you is better than that which has passed. That which is to come for you is better than that which has passed. So as the Prophet would would be elevated and he would be raised into the next station up when he would look at the previous station he would say astaghfirullah why would he say astaghfirullah from the previous station because now he had been elevated to an amazingly higher station that he would notice the difference between the previous station and this station even though when he was in the previous station Imam Ibn Jassu says that was Akmalul Kamal, that was the most perfect of perfect states for him. But now that he has been elevated, he said Astaghfirullah from that previous station. So it's not a matter of sin, it's a matter of being elevated in stations of proximity and closeness to Allah, such that the more a person is elevated, a person realizes that the previous stations were not so close. Are in proximity unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one. Imam al Qurtubi radiallahu an, he said, This verse could have the following meanings. Number one, seek forgiveness from Allah so that He may continue to protect you from wrong actions and for, and for the wrong actions of the believing men and women. So Imam al Qurtubi said, One of the possible meanings of this verse is that we know that the Prophet is infallible. So when Allah says to him, li dhambik, Seek forgiveness for your dhamb, 
This means ask Allah to continue upon you the state of infallibility and sinless, sinlessness. That Allah continues this upon you, that you seek this from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one. The other he said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was addressed and instructed to seek forgiveness. But those who were actually intended in the verse were his ummah. What does that mean? Allah said to the Prophet sallallahu seek forgiveness for your dhamb. We know he doesn't have any dhamb. We know he doesn't have any sins. We know he doesn't have any wrong actions. Imam al-Qurtubi said, Allah addressed the Prophet but intended his ummah. What benefit does that give? The scholars have said, the benefit that that gives is that when the ummah sees Allah instructing the Prophet in a matter, then they would put extra efforts in doing that which Allah has instructed their Prophet. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs the Prophet sallallahu then that should give a greater encouragement to the ummah that if Allah is instructing this matter to the Prophet sallallahu then we should be at the forefront of adhering to that matter also. So he was instructed, but his ummah was intended. Number three, he said, he sallallahu sallam was instructed to seek forgiveness in order to set an example for his ummah so that they could seek pardon for their sins. So why did Allah say, وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكْ Seek forgiveness for your dhanb. Not because he had sins, but rather so that he can set an example for us. And how did he set an example for us? The Prophet ﷺ said, وَإِنِّي لَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ فِي الْيَوْمِ وَالْلَيْلَةِ سَبْعِينَ مَرَّةً وَفِي رِوَايَةٍ مِئَةَ مَرَّةً The Prophet ﷺ said, And I ask Allah for forgiveness in a day and night 70 times, and in another narration he said 100 times. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum said, we used to oft hear the Prophet ﷺ say, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Why was he saying Astaghfirullah all the time? To set an example for us that we should be people of istighfar and seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does forgiveness seek? What does the seeking of forgiveness bring for us? Allah mentions in Surah Nuh that Sayyiduna Nuh salam said to his people, that he said, فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا وَيُمْدِدْكُمْ, بما ويمددكم بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ أَنْهَارًا Sayyidina Nuh a.s. what did he say? فَقُلْتُ I said, اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ Seek forgiveness from your Lord. إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا Indeed, he is the oft forgiving. What will happen? He will send the heavens upon you with rain. Rain will come to you. Why is rain needed? It's needed for the land, it's needed for the crops, it's needed for people to drink from. It's the means and the source of life is through water. If there's a drought, everybody and everything dies. Allah said, if you say, Astaghfirullah, I will send water upon you. And then, what's next? What's next is what everybody loves in this world. What does everybody love in this world? Wealth and their children. Everybody loves their wealth and everybody loves their children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is informing us that if you want goodness, if you want well-being, if you want Allah to aid you and assist you in your wealth and in your children, then say astaghfirullah. Then seek forgiveness from Allah. Allah said, وَيُمْدِدْكُمْ بِمَا وَيُمْدِدْكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ Allah will give you support in your wealth and in your children. وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ أَنْهَارًا And Allah will create for you gardens of paradise and He will create for you rivers of water. All of these are benefits of what? Saying, Astaghfirullah. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكْ Seek forgiveness for your dhamb. This was to set an example for his ummah that we should be people of istighfar. We should be people seeking forgiveness constantly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in particular in times like the one that like the times that we're living in, when illnesses are spreading, how do we prevent them from ourselves and our communities and our families and our households? By making istighfar and returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al-Sawi radiallahu anh interpreted it as 
this verse and said, Seek forgiveness for the wrong actions of your close kin and for the wrong actions of the believing men and women. Imam Sawi radiallahu anh said, وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكْ Seek forgiveness for your dhanb, i.e. for the sins of your close kin, of your relatives. Why didn't Allah say it like that then? Because the Ahlul Bayt are part of the Prophet وسلم, Allah said, seek forgiveness for your dhanb, i.e. the dhanb of your close ones, the dhanb of your family, the dhanb of your household, and that of your companions and the rest of the ummah. In Tafsir al-Jalalain, it mentions, uh, Tafsir al-Jalalain mentions that the Prophet وسلم, despite his infallibility, was commanded to seek forgiveness so that his ummah could follow him in seeking for forgiveness from Allah. Why, why was he instructed to seek forgiveness? So it becomes a sunnah for the rest of us to say Astaghfirullah. Is that clear? No. This is one of the most important notes in the entire book. And this was the last note that was written in the entire book. And this verse, its translation was changed after three years of the completion of the entire book before it went to print. The next chapter, so that was the chapter on the finality of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Alaihi Wasallam. The next chapter is Babu ma jaa fi sha'ri Rasulillahi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We should all put in efforts in reading all of the footnotes before we come. Because the footnotes are extremely important. The notes that have been placed have been hand-picked and very uh, meticulously chosen from an array of works of hadith. From a uh, very large array of works of hadith so that we can have the meaning of the work of the Shama'il uh, as close as possible to the minds of people, to their understanding. Is that clear? No. And that we clear up uh, ambiguous matters that people often misunderstand, misinterpret from, from the most classical works of hadith. And this is why we chose to only insert notes from the classical works of hadith so that we return this ummah back to its, to its very rich uh, and, and uh, very rich and uh, enormous uh, uh, heritage of, of knowledge. No. The third chapter Radiallahu anhu said, the blessed hair of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam reached the middle of his ears. So in the previous sessions we had the wafra that was up to the Prophet sallallahu blessed earlobes. The limma was between the earlobes and the shoulder and the jumma was up to the shoulder. Now he is saying that the blessed hair of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi reached the middle of his ears. So this must have been at another occasion, another time when the Prophet Sallallahu blessed hair was slightly shorter than the wafra uh, and Sayyidina Anas described the blessed hair at that time. The scholars have said that every single part of the noble body of the Prophet Sallallahu is of absolute importance and significance because every part of his noble body sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times. So his blessed hair, every strand of his noble hair was in worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we know this? Uh, Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an once saw a man prostrating in prayer with his hair tied in the back uh, like a ponytail. He went over to the man as he was praying and he untied the string around his hair. When the man completed his prayer, Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an said to him, Do not tie your hair whilst praying for, for hair prostrates and for every hair you will have a reward. The man replied, I only tied it so it would not uh, get dusty. Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an replied, It is better for you that it gets dusty. So the scholars have said, 
if the hair of a companion prostrates in salah, then what do you think the state of the hairs of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam are? Is that clear? And this is for men that if they have long hair, they should not tie their hair whilst praying. But this is not for women. This is only for men. If women keep their hair tied during the prayer, that's fine. But for men, they must not tie their hair during prayer. Why? Because when those hairs touch the ground, they are also in a state of prostration. So the scholars have said from that, that every part of the noble body of the Prophet ﷺ was at all times in worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next narration is from Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha who said, كنت أغتسل أنا ورسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من إناء واحد. She said, the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم and I would bathe from a single container. What does that mean? The scholars have said what the possible meanings of this is that the container that was used to keep the water in, that both the Prophet ﷺ and Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha used the same container from which they took water uh, to bathe, to perform ghusl. Is that clear? This is one. The other is, uh, th th this is what the scholars have said about uh, the container from which he sallallahu alayhi wa and Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha would bathe from. And the scholars have said that the amount of water that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to perform ghusl was a very small amount. Right? It wasn't a large amount of water. Why? Because the purpose of ghusl is so that every part of the body becomes wet. Unlike the way most of us now bathe and have showers whereby we are drenched in water as if we've come out of a pool of water. This is not how the Prophet ﷺ and his companions would bathe because water was extremely scarce. They would have to travel and walk for miles on end sometimes to bring back water so that they could use that for bathing, use it for wudu, use it for drinking, for their animals, etc. Right? So the container that the Prophet ﷺ used to bathe from and Sayyida Aisha, it was the same container. What does this indicate? The scholars have said, this indicates the love that the Prophet ﷺ had for Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha, that he ﷺ would use the same container or would allow Sayyida Aisha to use the same container from which he ﷺ performed ghusl from. Is that clear? وَكَانَ لَهُ شَعْرٌ فَوْقَ الْجُمَّةِ وَدُونَ الْوَفْرَةِ She said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at that time, his hair, his blessed hair, his blessed hair was above his shoulders, yet reached past his earlobes. Above the shoulders, yet reached past the earlobes. That technically is limma, but Sayyida Aisha used jumma, that was in between the earlobes and the shoulder. Is that clear? So here, Sayyida Aisha is describing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's blessed hair, either whilst he was performing his ghusl or after he had performed his blessed ghusl sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is that clear? And of course, when he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would perform his blessed ghusl, Sayyida Aisha in another narration, she said, I never saw from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his blessed, uh, his, his private area and nor did he see from me my private area. Is that clear? This was due to the extreme haya of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. The next narration is from Al-Bara ibn Azib radiallahu anhu said, Kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam marbu'an. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was of medium stature. His blessed shoulders were broad. Most of his blessed hair would reach his earlobes. Most of his blessed hair would reach his earlobes which means perhaps some of his blessed hair was shorter and some was slightly longer, but most of them reached his earlobes. The next narration is from An Qatada, from Qatada, uh, who said, I asked Anas radiallahu an, how was the blessed hair of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam? He replied, it was neither extremely curly nor straight. His blessed hair reached his earlobes. The next narration is from Umm Mihani, uh, the daughter of Abu Talib, the sister of Sayyidina Ali 
radiallahu anhuma. She said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam once entered Makkah whilst wearing four braids. Whilst wearing four braids. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, after he left Makkah al Mukarramah, after he left Makkah al Mukarramah, after migration, he went back to Makkah four times. The first time he went back was the time when he went to perform the Umrah of Qada. One year he went, but the Makkans didn't allow the Prophet ﷺ and the, and the companions to enter into Makkah. They said to him وسلم, if you go back this year and come back next year, we will allow you to enter into Makkah. The Prophet ﷺ agreed, he returned back and the following year he came back to perform the Qada of his last year's Umrah. This is the first. He also entered uh, 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 at the time of the conquest of Makkah, the Fath of Makkah, he entered into Makkah al Mukarramah. The third time was when he performed Umrah from the area of Jirrana. And the last time he entered into Makkah was when he went for his farewell Hajj. So after the Prophet ﷺ left Makkah al Mukarramah, he returned back to Makkah al Mukarramah these four occasions. In one of these occasions, Umm Hani radiallahu anha said, when he entered into Makkah al Mukarramah, he had four braids. Where were these four braids? So the hair of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he braided his hair. One braid was before his right ear, and the other was after his right ear. So in between uh, was the ear, and on either side there was a braid. And likewise, on the left hand side, there was a braid before the left ear and a braid after the left ear. The Prophet ﷺ braided his blessed hair and entered into Makkah al Mukarramah. The scholars have said the Prophet ﷺ usually would not braid his hair. He would usually not braid his hair. At this occasion, he braided his hair. Why? This was the situation of traveling. And when one travels through the desert, on a horse, on a camel, walking, and the journey is long, and one has long hair, it would be, become difficult to maintain and look after the hair whilst on this long, extremely long journey. So the Prophet wasallam braided his blessed hair, not as a norm, but as an occasional uh, uh, practice that he did whilst entering into Makkah al-Mukarramah. Is that clear? The scholars have said, number two, that it was the tradition of the Arabs that they would braid their hair because if they had long hair and they were traveling in the deserts, the, the sand and dust would go into their hair, into their open hair. So they would, out of convenience, they would braid their hair. Is that clear? And the Prophet ﷺ followed that practice of the Arabs and he braided his hair only when he was traveling sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that clear so the scholars have said if braiding the hair is a norm amongst a particular people then it's fine for a man to braid his hair if it's a norm amongst a particular people then it's fine for a man to braid his hair number 1 whereas if it's not a norm in a community, in a society, amongst the people that men braid their hair, then people should not braid their hair. Is that clear? Number three, those who choose to braid their hair in a community where it's a norm for men to braid their hair, their braids should not resemble those of women. Their braids should not resemble those of women. These are three uh, matters that the scholars have highlighted when speaking about the hadith in which the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam braided his blessed hair. The next narration is from Thabit al Bunani, who was the top student of Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu an. He said, "An Nashara Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam kana ila ansafi uzunehi." The blessed hair of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam reached the middle of his ears. Again, a narration regarding. Uh, the time in which Sayyidina Anas would see the blessed hair of the Prophet The next narration is on the authority of Ibn Abbas who reported the Messenger of Allah وسلم, would let his blessed hair fall freely. 
fall freely either on his blessed forehead or on his blessed ears. Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ, he would cover his blessed ears with his hair because he would let his hair fall freely. And sometimes his blessed forehead would also be covered with his hair that was falling from his blessed uh, head sallallahu alayhi wasallam onto his noble forehead. The idol worshippers used to part their hair and the people of the scripture, Ahlul Kitab, would let their hair, fo uh, hair fall. He sallallahu alayhi wasallam preferred to accord with the practices of the people of the scripture as long as he was not given a specific command regarding the matter. Thereafter, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam began to part his blessed hair. So, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, if he wasn't given a particular instruction from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he would rather make his practices similar to those of the people of the book, i.e. the Christians and Jews, than the idol worshippers. Why? The scholars have said, this was to uh, uh, this was to in, this was to draw the people of the book, the people of the scriptures, close to him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in showing them that he is a prophet, and they also believe in prophets who are brothers unto him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Is that clear? This was one. The scholars have said so. To uh, and number two, why he would want to align his practices with those of the people of the book so to stand strong against the idol worshippers and where do we see this also in when Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an he took a bet with an idol worshipper regarding the war between the Persians and the Romans what did the, Sayyidina Abu Bakr say he took a bet that if the Romans win, then we, you have to give me X amount of, uh, of camels. When he went back to the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet said to Sayyidina Abu Bakr, go and increase in the price, i.e. the amount of the bet increases in that, and also increase in the years. So the, year, the amount of years that he uh, agreed with was bidr sinin. The word bidr is a number between three and nine in the Arabic language and he increased in the bet also why because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam the victory of the Romans over the Persians Allah said غُلِبَتِ الرُّومُ فِي أَدْنَى الْأَرْضِ وَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ غَلَبِهِمْ سَيَغْلِبُونَ فِي بِضْعِ سِنِينَ لِلَّهِ الْأَمْرُ مِنْ قَبْلُ وَمِنْ بَعْدُ Allah said in بِضْعِ سِنِينَ the Romans will so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam would align himself with those matters with the, with, that the Christians and Jews practiced in that which he wasn't given any particular revelation. Why did he do this? He did this to draw them closer to him sallallahu alayhi wasallam so that they believe in his prophethood and in his finality sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Is that clear? And here we have to be careful that the Prophet ﷺ wasn't following the practices of the Jews and Christians. Right? Some people, they have a misunderstanding regarding the fasting of Ashura. The fasting of Ashura, the 10th of Muharram, this wasn't only in Medina al Munawwara. The Quraysh used to fast Ashura in Makkah al Mukarramah. Some people mentioned the narration of Ashura that occurred in Medina al Munawwara and make it seem that the Prophet didn't know what the Jews were doing. This is not the case at all. When the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina al Munawwara, he used to already fast Ashura before that. The 10th of Muharram, he used to fast it before that. When he came to Medina al Munawwara, he asked, What are these people doing, i.e., the Jews? He was told they are fasting the 10th of Muharram because they believe that was the day that Musa السلام, was saved from Fir'aun. What did the Prophet ﷺ say? He said to his companions, "Lain ishtu ila qadimin la asuman natasir." If I live till next year, I'm going to fast the ninth and the tenth. Why? So to oppose the people of the book. So to oppose the people of the book. Number one and number two. He said, "Nahnu ahqu bi Musa minhum." We have greater right over Musa alayhi salam than they do. 
Is that clear? So, we have to be clear about this hadith. That when the Prophet ﷺ asked about why the Jews fast on that day, and then he was informed, he ﷺ didn't then start to practice the fasting of Ashura. Rather, he used to already fast Ashura in Makkah. He just wanted to know what they were doing. When he found out that they also practice the fasting of Ashura, he said, we will fast an extra day because we have greater right over Musa salam than they do. Is that clear? What do, we ha what do we understand from this? That the Prophet ﷺ did not take any matter of his religion from the Christians and Jews, rather he took it from revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something very important that we need to understand in our time when people love to have gatherings and meetings, uh, multi-faith gatherings and multi-faith meetings, uh, oftentimes we have people, Muslims who sit in those meetings and they narrate this hadith and what do they say? The Prophet ﷺ followed the practices of the Jews. No, he didn't. He ﷺ used to already fast it from Makkah. All he did was asked why the Jews are fasting. That's it. And then he extended and added on so to oppose the ways of the Jews. Is that clear? No. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ also said about the beard. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, Wa'fu liha. The Prophet ﷺ said, Let your beards grow and trim your mustaches. So to oppose the people of the book who used to trim their beards or shave their beards. Is that clear? The Prophet ﷺ instructed his companions to oppose them in these matters. Which hadith did we reach? Sorry? Hadith? 31. No. The last hadith in this chapter is from Umm Hani radiallahu anha who said, I saw the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with four plaits. Again, this is the same time when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi went to Makkah al -Mukarrama. What else did the Prophet ﷺ do in the house of Umm Hani? He prayed duha. The duha prayer, he prayed in the house of... When he arrived to Makkah al-Mukarramah, he prayed duha prayer in the house of Umm Hani. How was Umm Hani related to the Prophet ﷺ? She was the Prophet's first cousin. Because she was the daughter of Abu Talib and the sister of Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. So he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed uh, a duha in her house and she saw that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had four plaits or four braids in bet uh, one before her, uh, his right ear, one after and the same on the left side. Now, now the blessed hair of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is, we see its significance uh, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam he used to distribute his own hair by himself amongst his companions sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Imam Muslim radiallahu an narrates from Sayyidina Anas who said, I saw the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wal halaqu yahliquhu whilst the barber was cutting his hair or shaving his head wa atafa bihi ashabuh. Can you imagine this? The Prophet ﷺ is having his blessed head shaved and his companions are all around him. فَمَا يُرِيدُونَ أَن تَقَعَ شَعْرَةٌ فَمَا يُرِيدُونَ أَن تَقَعَ شَعْرَةٌ إِلَّا فِي يَدِ رَجُلٍ Why would they... Why, why did they come around him? Because they didn't want a single hair to touch the ground. They would take every one of his hair sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was whilst the Prophet ﷺ was sitting there. Ju'shum al khair. He said, I gave allegiance to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave me his shirt, gave me his sandals and gave me some of his hair. Imam Bukhari and Muslim radiallahu anhuma narrate that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he in Mina he went to the Jamrah and he stoned it. Then he returned back to his residence in Mina and he, he slaughtered the animals 
Then he said to the Halaq, then he said to the Baba, Khuz, take. And he pointed towards the right side of his blessed head. In another narration, he said to him, Ha, I take from here. Khuz or Ha, take from here. Once he had shaved the right side, then the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Now take from this side, i.e. from the left side. ثُمَّ جَعَلَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يُعْطِيهِ أَيْ يُعْطِي شَعْرَهُ النَّاسِ Then he وسلم, began to distribute his hair amongst people. In another narration, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after he had his blessed hair uh, shaved, he gave some of them to Umm Sulaym bint Milhan, the mother of Sayyidina Anas radiallahu an. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal radiallahu an narrates with an extension, وَقَلَّمَ أَظْفَارَهُ وَقَسَمَهَا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ The Prophet sallallahu sallam, clipped his blessed nails and he distributed them amongst his companions also. And in another narration that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, دَفَعَ الْأَيْسَرَ إِلَىٰ أَبِي طَلْحَ وَقَالَ لَهُ إِقْسِمْهُ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, gave the left side of his blessed hair to Sayyidina Abu Talha and he told him to distribute them amongst people. Who was Abu Talha? Abu Talha was the husband of Umm Sulaym. Who was Umm Sulaym? The mother of Sayyiduna Anas. So Abu Talha was the stepfather of Sayyiduna Anas ibn Malik radiallahu an. Abu Talha was the, he's very important. Why is he very important? Because in most of the narrations we find that the Prophet ﷺ gave him all of his blessed hair on the day of Hajj to distribute amongst his companions. This is number one. Number two, why Sayyiduna Abu Talha? We are all indebted to him. Radiallahu an. Why? Because it was Sayyiduna Abu Talha radiallahu an who dug the blessed grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he, it was Abu Talha radiallahu an who entered into the blessed grave of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he was the one who created the lahad in, inside the grave of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And after he sallallahu alayhi wasallam was placed in the lahad, it was Abu Talha who made the wall behind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam the wall of the lahad. So I say Abu Talha is very important. So the scholars have said, in one narration we find that the Prophet ﷺ gave his blessed hair to Umm Sulaym. In another narration we find that he gave his hair to Abu Talha. The scholars have said, the Prophet ﷺ gave hairs to Umm Sulaym so that she distributes amongst the women and gave hairs to Abu Talha so he distributes amongst the men. Imam al-Zurqani radiallahu anhi said, إِنَّمَا قَسَمَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ شَعْرَهُ فِي أَصْحَابِهِ لِيَكُونَ بَرَكَةً بَاقِيَةً بَيْنَهُمْ وَتَذْكِرَةً لَهُمْ وَكَأَنَّهُ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ أَشَارَ بِذَلِكَ إِلَى اقْتِرَابِ الْأَجَلِ وَخَصَّ أَبَا طَلْحَةَ بِالْقِسْمَةِ التفاتا الى هذا المعنى لانه هو الذي حفر القبر الشريف ولحد له وبنى فيه اللبن امام الزرقاني رضي الله عنه said that the reason why the Prophet ﷺ distributed his blessed hair amongst his companions so that they can be a means of blessings for them till the end of time. And they, i.e. the blessed hairs, can be a means of remembrance for, for him that when people see the blessed hair of the Prophet ﷺ, they remember his person ﷺ. And he said, by giving the hairs to Abu Talha, this was an indication of the closeness of his departure from this world because it was Abu Talha who dug his grave and created his lahad. And he was the one who built the wall after he was placed in the lahad. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallam. And we know the story of Sayyidina Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an when he would uh, take the blessed hairs of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam into the battlefield in his imama, uh, so that Allah gave him victory at every point because of the blessed hairs of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Something extremely important that is of note now and here, and that is 
We have in hadith studies, hadith has are classified into different categories based upon their strength. The highest classification of hadith is mutawatir. Mutawatir. A mutawatir hadith is that narration which is narrated by multiple amounts of people in every generation until it reached the scholars of hadith. So a group of sahaba narrated it to a group of tabi'een who narrated it to a group of atba'a tabi'een. In every generation, there was only, always groups of people narrating it. The scholars said, hadith which fall in the classification of mutawatir are then divided into two categories. There are those narrations which are mutawatir lafzan wa ma'nan those that are mutawatir in their exact wording and meaning. Which means every companion and every person in every other generation narrated the hadith with the exact same wording. And of course with the same meaning. The second category of mutawatir is that people narrated the hadith with different wordings yet with the same meaning. The scholars said, in the first category of mutawatir hadith, there are only an, a very few amount of ahadith that are mutawatir, that are lafzan wa ma'nan. Lafzan and ma'nan, there are only a few ahadith that can be found in that category. Not many in comparison to the whole genre of hadith. The scholars, whenever they speak of an example of a hadith which is mutawatir lafzan wa ma'nan what's the example that they give that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said man kadhdhaba alayya muta'ammidan fal yatabawwa maq'adahu min an-nar aw fi an-nar the example that they give is that the messenger of allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said anybody who lies on my behalf man kadhdhaba alayya muta'ammidan Anybody who lies on my behalf intentionally, he should take up his seat in the fire of hell. So the scholars have said, it is extremely grave to say what the Prophet ﷺ didn't say, and then to say that he did say that. To fabricate narrations on his behalf is like taking up a seat in the fire of hell. The scholars of hadith have said, this is in regards to the blessed words that he pronounced with his noble tongue. Addition to that, this is also in regards to his blessed belongings and the items of his noble body, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Which means that anybody who claims to have a hair of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, should be extremely careful. Why? Because if a person claims a hair of the Prophet ﷺ, whilst they know this is not the hair of the Prophet ﷺ, whilst they know that this is not from his belonging ﷺ, then that person falls under this hadith when the Prophet said that person should take up his seat in the fire of hell. Why I'm mentioning this now and here is because we live in a very strange, dangerous time whereby people have now started to claim hairs of the Prophet ﷺ in amounts and in areas and in places that nobody ever knew of this ever before. And there is a business behind this that people are now selling the blessed hair of the Prophet ﷺ. Certain individuals have gone to the extent of making it a business such that they have a certain material of thread which only burns at extreme high degrees of heat. That they claim that they use this and distribute this and sell this and say this is hair, the hair of the Prophet ﷺ and the test is if we, if, if we place fire on it, it won't burn. It won't burn with a tiny flame. It needs extreme heat for it to burn. People who are doing this now in the world, 
they must fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because they fall under the same hadith, فَلْيَتَبَوَّأْ مَقْعَدَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ For somebody to have an item of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is the greatest of honor. But at the same time, this is the, one of the most difficult and most dangerous of responsibilities that befall those people who have these items. Aside from the blessed hair, we have now people replicating the blessed sandal of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and saying this is the exact sandal. This is unbefitting. It might be a replica of the exact sandal, but to say this is the exact sandal is injustice, is wrong. That person then claiming this item to be that which the Messenger of Allah placed his noble foot in and was from his belongings, from his possessions, that person falls under the same hadith, فَلْيَتَبَوَّأْ مَقْعَدَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ He should take up his seat in the fire. Therefore, the scholars have said, we should be extremely respectful with all of the items of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his belongings. Yet, we should be careful of not falling into traps of people who have made a business out of this entire, uh, uh, out of the relics of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We shouldn't fall, pray for them. Because sometimes people are in difficult situations, they want some blessings from somewhere or the other. Somebody might say to them, well, I've got the Prophet's hair, I can sell it to you for 5,000 pounds and your difficulties will be taken away from you. Don't fall for charlatans. Beware of people. If somebody says, I have the hair of the Prophet ﷺ, we respect the hair of the Prophet ﷺ as it is, hair, yeah, as it is the hair of the Prophet ﷺ from his noble body. We don't then accuse this person, but we leave this person's affair to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We leave this person's affair to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And people must be warned. That people must be warned, and I'm going to give you an even more striking warning. And that is, there are people in Madinatul Munawwara, in the city of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who are doing business on the blessed hairs of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They are selling hairs of the Prophet sallallahu And do you know how? It makes it even more evident that they are fake charlatans, <coughs> that they begin to claim that which they have no shame and no haya about. They claim that they have the blessed hair of Sayyida Fatima Zahra, radiyallahu anha. How shameless of a people are they? Sayyida Fatima radiyallahu anha, before she passed away, she said to her household and family, make sure you don't carry my janazah during the day so nobody sees the coffin of the daughter of the Messenger of Allah. And people are claiming to have the hairs of Sayyida Fatima. How rude. How unjust with the Messenger of Allah. People claim that they have the hairs of Sayyida Amina, the mother of the Prophet Sallallahu how is that even possible? We have respect and honor for the hairs of the Prophet ﷺ, but we should not fall prey for these charlatans and these fakesters, even if they say we live in Madinatul Munawwara. Do you know why? Because the Munafiks also lived in Madinatul Munawwara. And the Prophet ﷺ informed us that at the end of time, the Munafiks of Mad Medina will be purified of all of the hypocrites before the Day of Judgment, which means in all times, there will always be munafiks around. So we have to be extremely careful, not fall prey for people who are selling, people who are making a business out of it. The greatest relics that we have of the Prophet ﷺ are, the, are his blessed words that he left for us. His hadith is his greatest relics. If people can't give that honor and respect that they give to his belongings, to his hadith, then you know that they are after something else. That they are after something else. I want you to make this note in the chapter of his blessed hair, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Ottomans, they had the hairs of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that were transmitted in, through generations. They received them from the previous rulers of the, of the Umayyads and the Abbasids. 
and they were passed on. And the Ottomans in every generation, in every era, in every time, they would have chains of narrations for the, for the hairs of the Prophet And the way they would verify people's lineages back to the Prophet in the same way they would verify the Prophet's hair back to the Prophet So the most, uh, the most reliable hairs of the Prophet that we can visit are those that are in Istanbul. And those that were passed on by the Ottomans because they were the most verified of hairs of the Prophet sallallahu Is that clear? So we have to be careful about this matter. And now we have people opening up relics museums and they have mu relics of prophets who have gone when before the Prophet sallallahu how they found them and where they got them from, Allah knows best, right? So our tradition is a tradition of knowledge. Our tradition is a tradition of knowledge. What we take of the blessings of the Prophet ﷺ, of his noble relics and his belongings and his personal items, we only take it through knowledge. What does that mean? We verify it through chains of narration and that's when we take it. Other than that, we stay safe and away from such people, but we should not at the same time be disrespectful. Is that clear? We don't have to give a judgment. Silence is the best judgment. But we have to be careful of people who are making a business of the blessed items of the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring relief to the Muslims all over the world in the East and in the West, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, guide us amongst people you have guided, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, give us well-being amongst people you have given well-being to, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, bless us in that which you have given us of sustenance and provisions, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, we ask you for the good of that which you have decreed and we ask you to protect us from the evil, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, make us people of guidance and allow us to be uh, beacons of guidance, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, we ask you that you make us steadfast upon this religion, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, steadfast in following the ways of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, make us people of knowledge, practice, sincerity, piety, righteousness, and, 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 and grant us states of, of fear and hope in you, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, make us a people who you are well pleased with, this, with Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, take away from us all of those traits and characteristics and, and ills that draw us away from you, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, we ask you for all of the good that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked from you, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We seek refuge in you from all of the evils that he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sought refuge in you from, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, we seek refuge in you from all of the illnesses that are spreading across the world, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, we seek refuge in you for ourselves, our families, our relatives, our communities, and we seek refuge in you for humanity at large, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, we ask you that you protect us from all types of illnesses, whether they are physical or spiritual, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, we ask you that you make us a people of knowledge and a people of guidance and a people of goodness, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, protect us from evil, protect our children, our families, our households from evil, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, make our homes places of tranquility and peace, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Make our homes in which the prayer is established, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, make our homes in which the Quran is recited, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Make our homes places in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is spoken about more than anybody else, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, make, uh, make our homes places of security and comfort for us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, save us from the ills of this world, Ya Rabbil Alameen. From the evils that are around us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, we seek refuge in you. O oh Allah, give us refuge, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, we seek refuge in you. Give us refuge, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, we ask you for the believing people all over the world that you give them relief, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, the Muslims in China, the Muslims in India, the Muslims in Burma, the Muslims in Africa, O oh Allah, the believing people in Syria, in Yemen, in Palestine, 
oh Allah in Afghanistan, oh Allah, wherever the believing people are in troubles, in difficulties, in hardships, oh Allah, we ask you that none can relieve these hardships except you. Oh Allah, we ask you that you remove them from the believing people, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, we ask you that you grant us steadfastness upon Iman, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, this is the blessed night of Jum'ah. Oh Allah, we ask you for all of the blessings of this night, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, that you make us from the closest of people to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this night, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, we ask you to deliver our, our peace and our blessings and our salam to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on this night and allow for his blessed gaze to turn towards us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, we ask you that you allow us to visit Madinatul Munawwara and stand before him and say, As-salatu was salamu alayka Ya Rasulallah. Oh Allah, we ask you that you allow us to send peace and blessings upon him when we see him in our graves and when we stand beside him on the day of standing, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, grant us admission into the gardens of Jannah with him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Shield us from the fire of hell, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, we ask you for all of those good actions that will draw us close to Jannah and far away from the fire, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We seek refuge in you from all of those wrong actions that will draw us close to the fire and away from Jannah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, we seek your pleasure and the highest abodes of Jannah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, we ask for your pleasure and the highest abodes of Jannah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, forgive us, our parents, our teachers, our family members, our relatives, and all of the believing people who have gone before us or to go after us. Oh Allah, we ask for your forgiveness, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina azab al nar. Rabbana atmim lana nurana wa ghfir lana innaka ala kulli shayin qadir. Allahumma a'inna ala zikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Allahumma anta as-salam wa minka as-salam. تباركت ربنا وتعاليت يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد النبي الأمي الحبيب العالي القدر العظيم الجاه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين